caring God and a righteous and just God. But how wonderful that we serve a God who loves and cares for us, desires for relationships, Father, we are here this morning to proclaim how great our God is. And so, Father, we dedicate our service in your hands this morning, Lord, desiring for you to be exalted, Lord, desiring for you to reveal yourself to us in this place. Lord, we love you and free. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, before you grab a seat, turn your neighbor, introduce yourself. If you don't know them. Wow, amen, amen. Sweet time of worship. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Well, I am just compelled to share with you that uh, our men's retreat this weekend was spirit filled. Amen, men. <laughs> Gary Stutz, why don't you stand up for a second? Look at that t shirt. Look at it. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> So I saw Gary's t-shirt and I was just totally bummed that I didn't wear mine today. It was, it was an amazing time and, and, and after I took a look at, uh, you, you know, I just looked at everything that had transpired over the weekend and I had a chance to look back. What was impressed upon my heart yet again is, is that we have men here at our church that want nothing to do with what the world has to offer. Amen? And they want everything that has to do with the Lord and His righteousness for their lives. And, and you ladies, you can know that about the men in our church, and, and they desire to be obedient and to be submissive to the Lord and uh, to further his kingdom. And uh, we had a lot of inspiration uh, from the Lord in doing that this weekend. So, uh, ladies, uh, I'm sure you'll hear a little more volume from the men today uh, during worship, so that's just a, just a little bit of warning. You may have to, you know, ha hold a hand up to, next to your ears if there's a man next to you, so I'm just, just letting you know up front. So, newcomers, welcome to our church. We are so blessed to have you here as we continue on in our study uh, in 2 Thessalonians. We're actually beginning that today. We're, we're glad to have you with us. Uh, we would love to be able to know how we might minister to you. Uh, and the best way for that to happen is inside of your bulletins, we placed a welcome form in there for you. So we would encourage you to fill that out. Let us know how we might be able to pray for you or any other need that you might have. And once you complete those, you can drop them off in one of the two tithes and offerings boxes located at the back of the sanctuary. And we will uh, work on those requests as quickly as we possibly can. And also, as you're flipping through the bulletin, you'll notice various items. Our church is a very busy church in doing the Lord's work. We do a lot of activities together, breaking of bread and sharing fellowship uh, with the fellow believers in our church. Uh, and we'd like to make mention of a couple things that are coming up. The first of which is uh, you might have seen these impact rally forms uh, around in the church or on the information table. And I do want to give you a quick reminder that today happens to be the last day that you can attend uh, a first session. So the last bus for the first session of the impact rally is, is this evening. We're having one started about a half an hour ago at Calvary Chapel South. I encourage you not to get up and attend that one because you're going to miss church service. So don't do that. But at 6 o'clock p.m., at Westgate Chapel up in Edmonds. If you really wanted to serve, uh, you can head up there this evening. And yeah, that starts at 6 o'clock p.m. and you can catch the first session. So please be mindful of that. Uh, also, uh, concerning men, uh, if men, if you feel left out for some reason, you couldn't have the opportunity to attend the men's retreat, or you're kind of wavering and decided not to show up and, and you just want to be blessed by what the Lord's doing in our, in our men's, uh, in the midst of our men's lives, uh, we have the men's breakfast coming up this Saturday at 7.30 a.m. Uh, we're going to hear a special message by your senior pastor, Ron Sanchez. So I would encourage all you men, every single man here in the sanctuary, we would love to have you come out and looking forward to spending time with you uh, this Saturday. Uh, the next thing I want to mention is concerning our children's ministry. Now, I was led astray uh, the first service, and I thought this was actually colored by Pastor Allen. But that is not the case. It was actually done by Pastor Phil. So <laughs> apparently Pastor Phil is no longer doing children's ministry uh, and he felt a little left out. So we allowed him to color this for us and so he's needing encouragement lately. So if you see Pastor Phil, just let him know. Um, it was a great coloring job and just encourage him a little bit in that. 
So regarding the Faith at Home seminar itself, if you flip open the flyer, what, or over, not, don't, you can't open it, it's just paper. So if you flip it over, I, I want to say the purpose of the seminar is to equip parents with practical ways you can engage your children in your faith to help put them on a path to following the Lord all of their days. And that's what we want to do, amen? So this is a seminar equipped to give you some tools uh, to train your children up in the Lord all the days of their life. So we encourage you to come out for that Saturday, October 23rd from 9 till 4.30 p.m. The next thing that we do want to present is a video, and then we'll have uh, a guest come up and speak to the video. And I was pregnant with his child. I had people telling me all my life that I was no good. I realized what I had done, that this was actually a person who I had killed. My parents got divorced when I was a senior in high school, uh, which led me into a path of sort of dabbling in drugs. I was told that I was evil. It was a jinx. They would never amount to anything. At 15, I became involved with a 27-year-old man, and I lost my virginity to him, and I became pregnant by him. We decided that an abortion was the best choice because we could keep it a secret. I started getting high, and it was a good place for me because I could get rid of some of that pain. I tried to commit suicide. I didn't think I was worth anything. I remember laying on the table and I remember clutching my stomach and I can remember the tears rolling down my cheeks as I gave up my child. I felt abandoned, I felt rejected by my parents, I felt rejected by God, by the father of that baby. It was just a numbness. It was like I had no pain. It was like being dead. All those things that I had stuffed for so long, the guilt and the shame and the anger and the grief just began to come out. I had nightmares. I ended up incredibly depressed and I didn't know what to do. There was something wrong. There was something really wrong, something missing. And I had no peace. one night saying, Lord, if you're there, if you even exist, I need help. I need help. Someone introduced me to Jesus, and that was a start. It was wonderful. It was a transformation. It was a true turning point in my life where I realized that this is not all that there is, that there is an eternal hope, because if this was it, it was, it was terrible. It was just terrible. I still had anger and guilt and shame, and I knew that I needed more healing. And so I went in search of a healing, and I found Healing Hearts. I went into that Bible study, and it completely transformed my life. God said, okay, it's time. We are going to clean out all that pus. Getting into that study and realizing that um, Jesus bore all the wrath. The anger and the bitterness that I thought I dealt with, um, the abortion, of course, that I, I could not move past. That his blood taking away my sin, there was no more room for God's wrath. God came in and um, just cleaned house. I knew that Jesus died for my sins, and I knew I was forgiven, but I just didn't think that I could be loved. I realized how much unconditional love that God could give me if I would just take it from him. All the years of pain, of abuse, of feeling like I deserved everything that happened to me was lifted. And I understood truly for the first time, that even though I had made that choice as a Christian young lady, that he would still forgive me for that choice. That his blood still covered that choice. And he set me free. He gave me hope. He gave me a purpose. He cleaned
cleaned out my wounds. I never saw God as a father who loved me to that depth that he didn't want me to be hurt. That when I was five years old, he was there with me. I went into that Bible study guilty, full of shame, depressed, angry, anxious, fearful of anybody finding out what I had done in the past. And Jesus met me there. He took all of it from me. And all I have now is an undying love and a gratitude that I am loved with an everlasting love that will never go away. We serve an amazing God, a God who longs to draw his people to himself to heal them and to restore their lives. And that's what Healing Hearts is all about. I want to tell you that all of the ladies that you saw in this video have been completely restored and they're now serving God in their home churches, ministering to other women with the hope and healing that they have found. It's been truly humbling to me as I've seen God grow the ministry over the last 25 years to see what he's done from my kitchen tabletop to literally now being represented in 39 states and eight foreign countries and still counting. We've lost count actually. And um, all of you know that um, Pastor Ron has said that in the last three years we knew we needed to move the ministry out of our home after 25 years and find another location. So we set out to go to Colorado Springs to um, establish our headquarters office. Well, that didn't happen. A man plans his ways, but God guides his steps. God had another plan. But the last few years were pretty frustrating because as we waited on God, the ministry kept getting bigger and the office kept getting smaller, and I was getting a little stressed. And um, I had often hear Pastor Rong talk about the amazing provision that God has done with the church from its beginnings. Every time it grew, he'd provide another facility. And I would go, oh, God, I want one of those stories. <laughs> Please, Lord, I need one of those stories. And it was totally a miracle. A few months ago, we were in a basement with a six-foot corner desk using folding tables in our office. And we were praying for a room just big enough to hold all of our stuff. And he gave us a palace. It's truly a miracle, and we want to share that with you this afternoon. We're having a prayer dedication uh, at 3 o'clock, and the open house is from 3 to 6. The address is in the bulletin, and we really do want you to come by and celebrate with us because it's just amazing. He just, like, took his finger. We had no idea we would have an office in Puyallup, and he just said, this is where I want you to be. And so that's where we are, and we're glad we're staying. But as I see what God's doing in this church, and I see how amazingly he provided this office space for Healing Hearts in Puyallup, my heart beats with anticipation because he's going to do something really big. I don't know what it is, but God loves Puyallup, and he loves everybody that doesn't know him in Puyallup. And he wants to reach out to those people and not only save them, but he wants to bind up their wounds. So come by and celebrate with us and uh, have coffee and cupcakes. And um, anytime between 3 and 6, we'd love to see you. Thank you. Bye. Amen. Wow. How can you not be moved by that? And I'm always moved by the Lord working in people's lives. I think my favorite, my favorite part of that uh, was hearing the lady say, and the Lord met me there in the midst of her pain. And, and the Lord has met us in the midst of our pain. And because of that, uh, we can say with confidence that our church stands with Healing Hearts Ministries. Amen? Amen. Uh, so please come out for um, at the open house. And I can't think of anything else better to do right at this point. Uh, than to bow our heads in prayer and ask the Lord just to bless the remaining time that we have today. Father, thank you so much for meeting us where we are, Lord. It says in your word that the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. And Father, we are grateful for that, Lord. 
that you are near to us in our time of need. And you have come to us, Lord, in our time of need. And we have seen you do that in our very lives, Lord. And we ask that you would continue to do that, Lord, in other, other people's lives uh, that need you desperately, Lord, that are going through difficult times. We pray that you would use us to reach them, Lord. We desire to be used by you, Lord. And continue to train us, Lord, and to refine us that we might do that in other people's lives. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
we come to you this morning, Father. Father, we come this morning in the, all kinds of places, Lord. Father, those that are broken and hurting, those who are tired and weak, Lord. Maybe those who are searching for answers. But thank you and praise you that you are the answer. We have to look no further more than to look up at you, Lord. To look at the cross and how great our God is. Just as those ladies shared, Lord, that can radically change our lives. Come to you this morning.
rejoice in you this morning. We stand before you this morning in awe of the debt you paid for us, Lord. A debt, Lord God, that we owed that we could not pay by someone who paid that debt that you did not owe. We thank you, Lord God, for just releasing us, Lord, as I was just listening to those testimonies, Lord. I was reminded, Lord, of the burden, the heaviness of sin in our lives. And you relieved us of that. We stand before you and we thank you, Lord God, for that glorious act, that selfless act of dying on the cross for us. And it is in his name that we come before you and we pray for those who are out of work, Lord, that you would provide for them. Lord, those who are suffering ill health, that you would provide for them, O oh God, that you would minister to them. Lord, there's no sickness too great that you can't bring healing. We pray, Lord God, for those who have strayed from the faith, and ask that in your loving kindness you would draw them back to you. We pray for those who are with child, Lord, that they would have healthy pregnancies and healthy deliveries. We pray for those ministries that are outreaches of our church, Lord. We thank you for Sue and Gary and their commitment, Lord, to ministering to the hurting hearts of men and women across the world. Continue to show yourself strong on their behalf, Lord. Give Sue wisdom and insight in how to lead the ministry you've called her to, Lord. We pray for those who are serving in our military. We ask that your hand would be upon them, keeping them safe. We pray for our nation, Lord God, our president and his administration. And we pray, Lord God, that you would give him a broken heart. And that we would join him, Lord, in an attitude of repentance for allowing our nation to become a godless nation. Lord, we pray that you would show us what our role would be and how we might be able to stand in strength for righteousness. We pray for the Harvest Crusade that's coming up. And Father, we pray for us individually as a church that in boldness we would begin to reach out to the lost, oh God. Give us wisdom and insight on what that looks like. We pray for all of our missionaries. We ask that you would strengthen them this day, encourage them, Give them vision and direction for their ministries, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for this church facility. We thank you for the opportunity to be here. We wait perfectly for your timing, Lord, just as the testimony of Sue's, knowing, Lord, that as we pray and as we're faithful to just do what you've called us to do, Lord, you'll provide our own facility in your perfect timing. We trust you in that, O oh Lord. Thank you, Lord, for meeting us in our worship. Be glorified, Lord God, as we turn to you in the study of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Let's open our Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. And one of the ushers will be sure to get one to you. Just leave your hand up. They'll get it there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're going to look at chapter 1, the 12 verses that make up chapter 1 this morning. <clears throat> the fair has come and gone. Some of you are rejoicing in that. Others of you are maybe a little bit sad. How many of you love those crazy rides at the fair? How many of you like just, oh man, the crazier the better? Yeah, God bless you. I, you know, my uh, daughter and son-in-law and my daughter-in-law, Jackie, they, they love those crazy rides. And we were standing in line on the day of the fair and our family uh, fair day. We all we go as a family and all the grandkids and everything. And we were standing on the, the ride uh, in line for the zipper, the zipper. Now you should know just by the word zipper, 
that's not going to necessarily be the best ride you're going to want to take. But it, the zipper, how many of you have ridden the zipper? We were standing there waiting to hear the screams of Jackie and Jillian having fun. And uh, if you've ever ridden a ride with Jackie or even stood within an earshot of her riding, all she does literally is scream. She, from the time, she just screams. It's quite entertaining just watching that. But as we were standing there watching them getting ready to get onto the ride, uh, Jason noticed this sign and he said, check that sign out, Dad. And he took a picture of it and here's what it said. Quote, warning, the zipper is a violent and high-speed turbulent ride, exclamation point, that goes upside down, has sudden stops and jerks. All riders must be capable of holding on, good thing, and keeping their head in an upright position. Now, I don't quite understand the head in an upright position. You are zipping around, you're turning upside down, and how are you supposed to hold on and hold your head in an upright position? And as I was thinking of those words, violent and turbulent, as I was considering the three chapters we're about to begin studying this morning, I couldn't help but reflect on the turbulent and violent judgment that awake those people who take the things of God lightly. Those who love to think of Christians as a bunch of weak and superstitious people. Those who, use, who like to accuse us of using Christianity and the Bible and Jesus as a crutch. Those who have no regard for God. And when that judgment comes, the Bible tells us that it will make the zipper look like a Shetland pony ride compared to the traumatic, eternal experience that the judgment of God will be on the unrepentant sinner. And God's word is full of warnings, warning people of the impending judgment that is to come. And if you're not serious about being a Christian, Second Thessalonians is not one of those uh, easy reading books, certainly at least not the first chapter we're going to be looking at uh, this morning. So will you stand with me as we look at 2 Corinthians or 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, uh, beginning in verse 1. The Apostle Paul writes and he says, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds towards each other so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulation tribulations that you endure which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. In the flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Therefore we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we come before you humbly and we're sobered by these words that you have preserved over the centuries. We know your word is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And we avail our hearts to you this morning to speak to us. We give you free reign, Lord God. We want to be changed. We want to be transformed. We want to be equipped with what our response is to be to the craziness that's going on in the world around us. 
put a hedge of protection around this place, around our hearts, around our minds, around us as your church, that we might hear clearly that which you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Well, this obviously is the second of two letters that Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica. The first, which we just finished last week, and then this one, which is believed to have been written shortly after the first letter. Paul established the church at Thessalonica on his second missionary journey. And at the time of this writing, it's, the church had probably been ex in existence for two, maybe three years. We know that Paul spent three Sabbaths there, three or four weeks there ministering to them, and the transformation in their lives was so radical because they just embraced the things of the gospel just so simply. Uh, the gospel is not complicated. The occasion for Paul's writing of this letter seems to be that there may have been some misunderstandings about Jesus' second coming, and, and the church is trying to understand what their responsibility and what they were to be doing given the fact that the, church, that the Lord could come back for his church at any moment. And they were facing great trials and persecutions during this time. And some had just figured, well, since the Lord's going to come back any moment, we'll just kick back. And, and they had quit working and they had grown idle. And there were some who felt that because of the persecution and the trials and the tribulation they were experiencing, having stood strong in the faith, uh, they were... They felt that they were experiencing the day of the Lord already. They were felt like they perhaps were in the great tribulation period. And so Paul is writing, as the Bible scholar Warren Wiersbe describes, to encourage the suffering, to enlighten the confused, and to warn the careless. Now, whenever we're reading a text like this that sometimes can be hard to reconcile with the things that we see going on in the world today and, and the pressure to just dumb down uh, the gospel, we need to understand how intensely the enemy will work to distract us from the work that the Lord has for us, and especially in these last days in which we're living. We need to be reminded that uh, the enemy, that Satan and all of his demons, all of his cohorts, his army, hates God, and hates God's children. He, he hates us because we are lovers of God. And he'll do anything and everything that he can to bring confusion into any situation, confusion to the scriptures, and if possible, confusion to you as a believer as to the things the Lord is saying in regards to his return, in regards to your salvation. He always wants to lie to you. That, that's his, his whole thing. In fact, Jesus described him as the father of lies. You realize it is not, a, it is not possible for Satan to tell the truth. And so Paul is just addressing some things that they had been misled in. He doesn't care. Satan doesn't care how you're misled. He doesn't care how it happens. And so when we find ourselves in such a, such a situation where we're not sure what the scripture is saying, then we must ask the Holy Spirit for discernment and confirmation from his word as to whether the things we're uncertain about are truly biblical or not. And secondarily, if they are true, we're to ask the Lord to bring clarification to the spiritual truth uh, that we may be having trouble understanding. And we can take great encouragement because 1 John 2.27 tells us that we don't need anyone to teach us because we have the Holy Spirit who is within us and he's teaching us of these truths. And the Holy Spirit will get the job done. I talked to somebody just recently who was confused about some spiritual issues in their lives. And we mustn't make the mistake. Sometimes I think for those of us who have been walking longer in the Lord, I think sometimes we make the mistake of, of thinking that somebody isn't hearing uh, from the Lord or hearing or understanding things clearly because they don't speak Christianese. They don't say all those things that Christians are supposed to say. And when we just be, we develop a, a bit of a separate language, we need to be aware that to a new believer, they may not be familiar with those, those terms. And we need to look and dissect what they're saying so we can really get at the heart of whether what their understanding about the scriptures is valid or not. And this particular person, fairly new to their faith, they were having some trouble understanding some things, discerning some things that were really, quite frankly, bad doctrine. 
And I had to reassure them that they were definitely hearing things clearly. In other words, the Holy Spirit was doing his job. And he will never steer you wrong. If you're unsure about a bit of scripture, just say, Lord, I need you to show me. I need you to reveal to me what these scriptures mean. And he's faithful to do that. And so it's in that vein that Paul is writing and he says, uh, Paul, Silvanus, who we also know to be Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father, and to the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we know, having read, in fact, this is the last book over the past nine years that we'll have studied completely through. When we finish this book in, in two weeks, we will have, have studied through the entire New Testament. And in every one of Paul's 13 epistles, in his 13 letters to the churches, he always included grace and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that he did it intentionally to remind the church, to remind us, first and foremost, where it is that true grace and true peace come from. You see, before we can accept and appreciate and understand the judgment and the wrath of God, uh, you heard me correctly, I said to appreciate it. As believers, we need to appreciate the wrath of God in, in the same manner that we appreciate the love of God. Before we can accept and appreciate and understand the judgment and wrath of God, we must understand His grace, His unmerited favor. For without an understanding of His grace, then we'll never fully understand His true nature. Yes, He is a God of love. But he is also a God of righteous indignation. And the Bible tells us in Ephesians 2, 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We need to understand that God's gift of salvation is his grace towards us. It's a gift to us. It's undeserving. There's nothing we can do to deserve salvation. In fact, quite the contrary, uh, we deserve condemnation. And one of the reasons that people don't understand or appreciate the grace of God is because they truly think that they are undeserving of His judgment and wrath. And the moment you think you're, un you're deserving of something from God other than punishment, then you're really thinking way too highly of yourself and you're demonstrating an ignorance of who God really is and how holy He is by nature and how unholy we are. By nature but you see once we understand what we truly deserve God's judgment and punishment and instead because of God's grace you receive his love and forgiveness you receive what it is that you don't uh, deserve then you do deserve or don't then it's then and only then that true peace comes into your life no matter what you're going through and isn't that what we saw on, on, the, on the video, hearing the testimonies of these women. You could just see the heaviness of their sin, not believing they could ever be forgiven, not believing that they could ever be loved. And then you just see the transformation as they began to talk about when they met Jesus. And I'll guarantee you that there wasn't anybody there scripting that. Oh, you know what? The, the transformation wasn't quite enough. Can you give it a little bit more punch? Some, no. You just start talking to any of you. You start talking to me. You start talking to any number of you about what your life was before you met Jesus Christ. And you're going to be with the hell. Oh, this is what I was. And then I met Jesus. And that's what it is. It's what he does for us. Ephesians 2.13 says, But now in Christ Jesus you were once far off. You've been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace. Jesus is our peace. Now he says in verse 3, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting. Now we know from Paul's first letter why it was he was so thankful for them. We know from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, he said, we give thanks to God for you, always making uh, uh, mention of you in our prayers without ceasing, remembering your work of faith, uh, your labor of love, and your patience of hope. Paul was blown away by their eagerness to embrace the simplicity and the power of the cross and the resurrection, how they faithfully served the Lord as they were patiently awaiting for his return. 
He also said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 that for this reason we also thank God that when you received the word which you heard from us, when you received the gospel, you welcomed it not as the word of man, but as it is in truth, the word of God. And so here in Paul's second letter, he loved the church at Thessalonica. He adds two more things. First, he says, because your faith grows exceedingly. And second, because the love of every one of you all abounds towards each other. Now, I love this picture of the Thessalonians' faith here, that from the time that, that Paul had first shared the gospel with them until the present, their faith was still growing. In fact, Paul says, your faith grows exceedingly. And there's nothing more encouraging than when you find someone who, as the years have passed, have a fervent faith in the Lord that is just continuing to grow. I just love talking to people, oh man, I haven't heard from you, how's it going? Oh man, you wouldn't believe some of the things the Lord is doing in my life. That is so encouraging. And yet few things are more discouraging than when you find out that someone who once seemed to have that, that vibrant faith and love for Jesus, that they now have a faith that is weak, weak or non-existent at all. I got a phone call this past week from a family member uh, a, a niece, one of my nieces in Colorado uh, and she was very distraught and she was telling me that her husband wanted a, a divorce, husband of six years. And here was a young man once a, uh, professed a, a knowledge of God and a desire to serve him and in fact had served him uh, in a music ministry and a group of guys that would go around and minister in churches doing some rap music. In fact, I'll never forget meeting him and he, he kind of had that, that little rapper look to him and I always would tease him about that a little bit and, and uh, he introduced himself to me as DK, which is stood for Demon Killer. That was, his, uh, that was his rap name. And the more I talked to him, I said, you know, I'd like to have a rap name. I said, can you, can you give me a rap name? I can't rap, but can you give me a rap name? And he said, well, let me think about it a little bit. And pretty soon he said to me, I got one for you. And I said, what is it? And he goes, Mr. Clean. He says, you are Mr. Clean. And my heart was broken as I agreed to call him. And I called him. And you could just hear the heaviness. I said, what's going on? He said, well, he said, I said, DK, this is Mr. Clean. And of course, his, his, his mind and heart, I'm sure, were just reflecting back to when we would have some, some good times, perhaps when we went out and ran around the track before we went into the army and I tried to make it a mile and I couldn't quite make it a mile and how the whole family went. And all of these memories, I'm sure, were flooding as I'm talking to him. And you could just hear the heaviness of his heart. It just Things just aren't working out. I said, I said, you know you're not happy. I said, you know the only time you have a sense of happiness is, is when you're doing some of the foolish things that you're doing. And you could just hear that heaviness. His faith had fallen to the wayside. It's so very sad. H.A. Ironside said this, quote, It is a pitiable thing when a Christian's present state is lower than it was years ago when he was first converted. Is our faith growing exceedingly? Have we more confidence in God today than we had when we came to Him in the beginning of our Christian life? Have we so proved and tested Him through the years that we can count on Him now in a larger and fuller way than we did when we were first brought to know Him? If this is not true, then it is evident that we are in a backslidden condition." End quote. And the most wonderful thing about our God is that while this can be the reality in every person's life, if they let their guard down, if they take their eyes off of the Lord, that no matter what place God may find us in, that all we have to do is be willing to come back. All we have to do is be willing to repent, to ask God's forgiveness, and God is ever waiting to receive us back if we repent and ask His forgiveness. And I'm continually amazed at how much God loves us and how willing He is to restore us to Himself. It is so incredible. Well, not only was their faith growing, continuing to grow, but Paul says their love for one another was growing as well. He says the love of every one of you all abounds. That word means superabound toward each other. 
I love that about our church. You know, this after second service, we're going to have a church potluck, and we're just going to be uh, abounding in love for one another and abounding in food with one another. I love that our love superabounds towards each other. We really saw that this weekend at the men's retreat, uh, laughing and competing and just having a good time, getting fed and and crying. We were crying. I mean, this was this was if. It almost sounds like an oxymoron, but it, it was a men's retreat cry fest. I mean, there was just guys crying. And at one time, I was getting all choked up, and tears were coming. And, and Pastor Jason was teaching, and he goes, he's got tears in his eyes. He goes, don't cry on me. And, and I'm just looking at him, and I'm just thinking. And he started talking about how we're good soldiers. And I just started chuckling to myself. I say, what kind of good soldiers? <laughs> I'm a good soldier. We're soldiers. <laughs> Their love was abounding toward one another. We're committed to love and to care for one another. So much so, verse 4 says, that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Now, I want to look at this for just a moment. And I want to share with you that the Lord really rocked my world. As I, as I was rereading this text and meditating on it, I was struck by these words, in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. And the Lord really spoke to me of how little I've suffered from persecutions and tribulations. Now, what do I mean by that? I want you to think with me for a moment about suffering. Because it dawned on me that so often, our suffering as Christians is really measured no differently than the suffering of non-believers. Uh, for instance, sickness, financial difficulty, broken relationships, and death, which are valid points of suffering, but sometimes we put this idea of persecution, suffering, tribulations, we put those categories uh, in, in, that, in that vein of, of, of tribulations and suffering, when in fact, our suffering in that way is really no different than the world's. But it dawned on me as I was thinking about what Paul was saying here, and I was compelled to ask this question, how have I suffered in regards to living out my faith? What is it that I've suffered from in regards to living out my faith? Ironside again said this, quote, one could not be a Christian at all could not be indwelt with the Holy Spirit and not suffer with Christ. The very fact that we belong to Him and have received a new and divine nature makes us suffer as we go through this world which has rejected Him. But to suffer for Him is something more than that. It is to take so definite a stand for Him that we become an object of the world's hatred. And it is as we are thus prepared to endure grief and wrong in faithfulness to Christ that we have the opportunity to prove ourselves worthy of the kingdom of God to which we belong by the new birth. You see, suffering and persecution comes when we behave in a manner that we become the objects of the world's hatred because they hate righteousness, because they hate Christ. We were coming last night to the Veritas service. Pastor Jason and I, we had to leave the retreat early to do the service last night. And as I was coming off, as we were coming off the exit on 512 to Meridian, I noticed there was a girl that was a fairly young girl that was going down the road, just you know, 55, 60 miles an hour texting while she's driving, full on texting. And of course, many of us are aware of the, the sad news, the very sad news of, of this little toddler as this car was parked up in Bellingham, stopped to let a mother and her eight-year-old and five-year-old and toddler cross the street. And there was a girl, 17-year-old high school girl, Bellingham High School, hits the back of the car full speed, pushes it into the family and kills the little toddler girl. And it believes, they, they, they suspect that there could have been some cell phone uh, involved there. And I don't know if it's my older age, I don't know what's going on, but uh, I looked at this girl and I tapped on the window as if that was going to get her attention. 
And then I said, Jason, honk your horn. And so he honked her horn and she turned and looked at me and I went. <laughs> she put one finger up as well, but it wasn't doing this right now. She just full on gave me the bird. That's what she thought of what it was that I was saying. Listen, people in disobedience, they hate to be reminded of truth. They hate to be reminded. And so I asked the Lord, Lord, how much have I suffered for the sake of the gospel? And I realized not that much. Now, I didn't feel condemned. I didn't feel like the Lord was ashamed of me or anything. But simply he drew me to wanting to consider, one, why is it that I've not suffered more, Lord? And number two, is there something I need to change in my life? Is there something I need to pray for in my life to change that? And as I continue to meditate on that, I realize that there have been times in my life when I've suffered for the gospel's sake, and I realize that it has been when those family members who once professed a love for the same Jesus that I serve, only to find out that they no longer did, that they drifted away, and consequently the persecution came. Oh, aren't you holy? Oh, I guess aren't you just so perfect? Many of you have heard those things. And as we consider what Paul's saying here in the context of Paul's letter, I think it's important to recognize and to understand that if we're living the Christian life that the Lord intends us to live in, we're going to face suffering through persecution and tribulation. And to be honest with you, I'm, I'm getting excited about it. You could pray for me. You could say, Lord, we heard in, in the study today that Pastor Ron wants to get persecuted more and wants more tribulation for standing in faith for the gospel. I'm giving you full permission to say, Lord, bring it on. <coughs> Dear Lord, give me the strength as you uh, give my wife the strength as that happens. But you see, that's what, that's what being a Christian is all about. Paul said to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.12, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And that persecution will oftentimes come from those you love the most and who are supposed to be loving you in return. We must be renewed in our understanding that this is just part of what it means to be a Christian. We need to accept this truth and then recognize that we are in good company with others in the body of Christ. How cool is it going to be if when we all rise up as good soldiers and just as we were exhorted, endure hardship. I, I love what, uh, what one of the teachings said. Uh, it said that, that we as, as good soldiers must endure hardship. And the pastor made this point. He said the hardship is guaranteed to come. It is going to come. But the only thing that is optional is whether you'll endure or not. So hardship is going to come. Opportunity is going to come when we can stand for Jesus Christ. But the question is, is what will we do when we're given that opportunity to stand? And we can take great comfort in such times of persecution through our Lord's words. Uh, John 15, 18, when Jesus said, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. I think furthermore, it's important to understand the spiritual truth that when we're facing persecution and tribulation for our faith, it actually serves to further advance the gospel and strengthen our faith in the process. When you look at church history, you will find that in every instance, including the book of Acts chapter 8, when Stephen, they stone Stephen and everybody gets a little worried and freaked out about it, what do they do? It says that the church scattered throughout Judea and Samaria, just scattered everywhere. And what did they do? They started preaching the gospel. You see, there's power when people witness others who are willing to lay down their life for the sake of the gospel. And so Paul says in verse 5, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God. In other words, such persecution comes as a result, as a direct result of, it's manifest, it's made evident by the response of the unbeliever or the nominal believer's response towards the righteous judgment of God. That you may be counted worthy, he says, of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer, verse 6, since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. Now we talked about this idea of righteous 
indignation. We talked about the wrath of God in our study through 1 Thessalonians. But it bears repeating because it's a common theme throughout the Bible. Paul says, look what he says here in verse 6. He says, it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. We must never think that God's judgment, and in this case tribulation upon those who trouble the cause of Christ, is unrighteous. God can do what he wants to do because he's God, because he created us, since we are his creation, since he makes the rules, we're obligated to follow, and we should have no complaint with the consequences of disobedience. Amen? We should have no complaint with that. I shared with you before that, that time that I left here, and I think it was a baptism, or I was heading to the creamers in my little blue truck, and I just pull on 512, and I get pulled over. And I realized that it's because I hadn't put my seatbelt on. I was going to just wait, I guess, till I got halfway to the creamers or whatever. And so I'm pulled over. He gets out of the, the highway patrolman, gets out. <clears throat> and I, with my head, not moving my head, kind of like the zipper ride, don't move your head. And I took the seatbelt. <laughs> and I clicked it. And he came, and I said, yes, officer. And him, being a seasoned officer, said, did you just put that seatbelt on? And me, being a seasoned Christian, said, yes, I did. <laughs> and so the officer giving me the ticket, it was a righteous act. There was no argument from me. I knew it was the law. And he had every right to give me the ticket and so it is even more so with God not only in his tribulation upon those who trouble us is a righteous act but look what it says and this is great news for us but it is also a righteous thing verse 7 and to give you who are troubled rest see we don't have to worry about the the, the trouble and the persecution and the suffering we go through for Christ's sake we don't have to worry about not having rest in the midst of that because it is a righteous thing for God to give us rest. Now, notice here the latter part of verse 7 and 8 and, and 9. Here's where the warning of the turbulent ride comes. Notice how strong Paul's language is here. He says, to give you who, who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, uh-oh, verse 8, in flaming fire, taking vengeance, and Paul mentions two types of people, those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's saying, the Lord's going to come in flaming fire and he's going to take vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the Bible makes it very clear that though this is coming, there is no excuse for anyone to not come to faith in Jesus Christ because God so loves the world that he has made it impossible for man to stand before him and be able to say, well, I never had the opportunity to know you. And that's the lie that a lot of people, a lot of unbelievers want to say. Well, how could God possibly send somebody to hell? What kind of loving God is that? And they fail to understand that God provides a myriad of opportunities for people to come to faith in Christ. He desires that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. So I want you to hold your place in there, and I want you to head to the left, and I want you to look at the book of Romans. It's the first book after the book of Acts. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. I'm going to give you three quick things scriptures that you can point to to help people understand that man is without excuse. Number one, God has given us his creation. Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest, it is made evident in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, 
so that they are without excuse because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God nor were thankful but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. So man is without excuse because God has given us his creation. I'm reading uh, the book about Brother Lawrence, uh, Practice in the Presence of God. Listen what one of his friends observed about him. He said this, quote, In the winter, seeing a tree stripped of its leaves and considering that within a little time the leaves would be renewed and after that the flowers and fruit appear, Brother Lawrence received a high view of the providence and power of God which has never been erased from his soul." End quote. In other words, he, he studied, he looked, and he pondered creation, and he realized that God was real, that God existed. And one of the lies of the enemy is he has us so steeped in the Xbox and, and the Wii and this, and that we're entertained to death that when we don't stop to reflect on how loudly God speaks through his creation. Secondly, uh, turn uh, to the left, one, one uh, past Acts to John chapter 15, verse 26. John 15, verse 26. First, man is without excuse because he has given us his creation. And then here in John 15, 26, man is without excuse because he's given us the Holy Spirit. Verse 26, John 15 says, But when the Helper, that is the Holy Spirit, comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. In other words, he's going to tell people about Jesus. That's what his role is. 1 Corinthians 12, 3 says, Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So God has provided through the Holy Spirit that man would be without excuse. Look over at uh, John 16, chapter 16, look at verse 8. John 16, 8, when he, again the Holy Spirit has come, he will convict the world of sin, he'll convict the world of righteousness, and he'll convict the world of judgment. That's the role of the Holy Spirit, to draw people to Jesus. He convicts the world of sin. He points them to Jesus, who is our righteousness. And I believe, ultimately, he reveals to the heart of, the to the heart of every person that judgment is to come. That's where that guilt feeling comes. If there were no God who would give us a sense that we need to satisfy a higher power, we wouldn't feel guilty about anything. When you talk to people about going to heaven and whether or not they're sure they will go there, have you ever tried asking somebody that you know is not a believer and just say, you know, can I ask you a crazy question? It's strictly hypothetical, but if something were to happen to you today, do you know for certain that you would go to heaven or would you say that's something you're, you're working on? And they'd say, well, I, I would hope so, but, you know, I'm not sure. Now, why, why are they answering that way? Because they have an understanding that they're not good enough to go to heaven with a perfect God. And so the Holy Spirit puts that in there, speaks to them. There's that general sense. They know that they don't deserve heaven. And somehow, how can I earn it? And it's based on how they live their life. They, they deserve judgment, they know. God has put eternity into their hearts, as it says in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 3, verse 11. And then third, God has placed us in the perfect place and time for the purpose of receiving Jesus. I want you to turn with me one book over to the right to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, verse 26. Man is without excuse because God has revealed himself in his creation. He's without excuse because he's revealed himself by the Holy Spirit. And here in Acts chapter 17, we see that he is without excuse because he's placed us in the perfect place and time for the purpose of receiving Jesus. Look at verse 26, Acts 17, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him though he is not far from each one of us. So man clearly 
is without excuse. Now go back to 2 Thessalonians. Because it's hard to wrap our mind around what we're going to read in verse 9 and what it is that awaits those who reject God's truths unless we fully understand how many opportunities God has provided man to be saved. When I was working in downtown Seattle, there was a carpool lane that was an exit into the main part of the city. And some of you may know which exit I'm talking about. I think it moved you onto James or someplace right there to the heart of downtown. And, um, uh, and if you don't take that, if you're not in a carpool, you have to take the, the, the longer one. It takes you longer to get there. It just didn't make sense to me. And they didn't ask me when they were planning the, the, the traffic and all of that. And so I thought, you know what? It just doesn't make sense to me. I'm sure that this is for carpool and individual riders who need to get off on that exit. And so every time, it wasn't very often, but every time I, I drove, I'd go ahead and take that exit. And I even asked somebody in our office one time, I said, listen, you know that exit, da, 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 da. Oh, oh yeah, I know that exit. Uh, single riders take that? Because it just doesn't make sense. It, you shouldn't. Oh, no, I, I think it's okay for single riders. So I would take it. You know, every time I'd think, ah, you know, I wonder if this is about, but I'm, I'm sure it's right, because it just doesn't make sense. Well, one time I found out how much sense it made as I was coming around the corner, and there's the highway patrolman. He's pulling a policeman, motorcycle cop, pulling me over. Now, I don't, want, I, I don't have, like, warrants out for my arrest or traffic tickets. I want you to understand that. Just a couple little incidences that happen to fit into the message. So he pulls me over. And, uh, you know, let me see your license and everything. Did you know that this is a carpool aid? Well, officer, uh, I did, I, I understand that, but it, I, I thought it was also okay for single riders. Very again, just, you know, heard it a thousand times. And he mentioned the number of carpool only lane signs I had to pass to get to that point. In other words, I had to ignore all of those warning signs and then somehow try to justify to the officer why I should take that. You see, God has provided so many warnings in the Bible, so many warnings in Scripture, so that man is without excuse. And so Paul says in verse 9, he says, These, uh, that is, those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Now, since we are bound by time, it is hard to grasp everlasting, isn't it? It's hard to grasp infinity. I used to love just asking my dad what the definition of his infinity was, and he would say, well, son, here's the definition of infinity. If the world were a solid brass ball, and every thousand years a dove flew around and brushed its wing against that brass ball, by the time that the earth wore down from the brushing of that wing every thousand years to the size of a BB, he said, son, that's the beginning of infinity. And I used to just go, whoa, infinity everlasting is a long time. The English dictionary says it, it means lasting or enduring through all time, eternal. There is no question in my mind and heart that God is everlasting and that those who have accepted Jesus will experience his everlasting love. And conversely, I'm certain by God's word that it is true. And those who have rejected Christ in this life will experience everlasting destruction. Why? Because his word says so. And Paul is saying not only the fire that will never be quenched, but Paul says the absence from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. In other words, when you read Philippians 2 verse 8, listen to what he says. Being, full, being found in the appearance as a man, Paul writes, Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee, listen, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now we know that that will take place at the great white throne judgment at the end of the millennium when Christ will be seen in all of his glory on his throne. And I want you to imagine having seen that 
your knee bows, you confess that he is indeed Lord, and then, in horror, you hear the words, depart from me, I never knew you, because you rejected me on earth. You never desired to know me. Paul says this will take place in verse 10 when he comes in that day at his second coming to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Testimonies are such powerful things. We've heard three of them this weekend and God really moved through them. The Lord really spoke to my heart. This was, this was the best men's retreat that I've ever been on in the way that the, that the Lord moved and spoke to my The power of a testimony, that's what we saw. I mean, I've seen that two or three times. I get choked up every time. That's the power of a testimony. And Paul is saying that, that uh, because our testimony among you was believed, therefore, verse 11, he concludes, we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of his calling. We're counted worthy as we're found faithful in Christ Jesus and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. Why? He says that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. God loves us. He gave us the Holy Spirit to empower us and to equip us for the work of the ministry, to be able to withstand the persecution and the suffering that comes for taking a stand in Him and to be able to find rest and peace. That that is a righteous thing as well. Know oh, how I long to fulfill all the good pleasure of His goodness in my life, to experience His work of faith with power. Oh, I'm praying for a church. Your leadership's praying, Lord, move in power in our church. I long to have the name of our Lord Jesus Christ glorified in me, glorified in my life. And then how this works, I don't completely know, but I believe it to be true because it is in God's word that somehow I will be glorified in Jesus. I pray that that would be your heart as well. Oh, I rejoice in the day that we continue to grow in an understanding. If we begin to, to, to grasp these truths together, as Sue was saying, look out, look out. And I will say that there is a momentum uh, that is building in hearts that are being transformed. There's a momentum building in our youth ministry. And we need to just fasten our seatbelt because it is going to be a thrilling ride. It already is. Father, we ask that you would help us to fulfill all the good pleasure of your goodness in our lives. We pray that you would give us a longing to experience your work of faith with power, and may the name of our Lord Jesus Christ be glorified in our lives and in turn that we may be glorified in Him. Lead us, Lord, as individuals by Your Holy Spirit. Lead us, Lord, as Your church, Your church. Lead us by Your Holy Spirit. Let's just still our hearts before the Lord in these closing moments and prepare our hearts for communion with no movement in the sanctuary. Let's still our hearts before Him. And let's focus on the blood that was shed on Calvary. That we might know with certainty that we're spared of the righteous indignation, the wrath of God that is to come. And I pray that as we consider that we've been saved by the blood of the Lamb, that we would have a burden to take such a stand for Christ that others would come to know Him as well. 
You know, somebody was willing to pray for us and to tell us about Jesus. And there may be some of you that maybe you're discouraged. You know, prior to the men's retreat, I, I was coming through a little bit of time of discouragement. I, I didn't want to in any way drift from the faith, but I just, I wanted more of the Lord. And I was weary by people who just weren't eager to embrace the power of the cross. And, oh, the Lord answered that prayer and filled me to overflowing. And he can do that with you. There may be some of you that maybe you've never come to faith in Christ. Maybe you don't know Jesus as Lord. Maybe you're concerned about hearing those words, depart from me for I never knew you. Well, he's waiting for you to call upon his name. And the Bible says that all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And all you need to do is say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I realize by your word that I'm toast without you. Take my sin. Forgive me that I might receive you as Lord and Savior. As we worship the Lord and as we surrender our hearts and the communion emblems are being distributed, just hold on to them. We'll take communion together. If you're not a believer, and oh, I pray that everyone is, but if you're not, the Bible's clear that the Lord's Supper is not for you, but pray that prayer of confession. Become that new creation in Christ, born again of the Spirit, and you're free to partake. Don't wait. Cry out to Jesus. Well, let's just bring our hearts before him in worship. Thank you. 
Jesus gave us the bread and the cup on the night he was to be betrayed just hours before he was to be crucified because he wanted us to be reminded of our sins being washed away. And I'm not sure we fully understand how profound that is. That our sin once separated us from a holy God. And because he so loved us, he provided a way for our sin to be dealt with and washed away. Jesus, within hours of his crucifixion, said, This is my body. This bread represents my body, which has been broken for you. And he said, As often as you eat this bread, do it in remembrance of me. As we eat the bread together this morning, let's be mindful of his body on the cross, paying the penalty for our sins that had not been dealt with would have condemned us to hell. Let's partake together. Then he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of my blood, the new and everlasting covenant. And what was significant about that is the only covenant that the people knew at that time was the old covenant that they could not live up to. The old law, which Paul said was the tutor to bring people to Christ. And so what he was saying, you no longer have to live by a bunch of rules and regulations that you can't follow. But you now live by the new and everlasting covenant, my blood, which has been shed for the forgiveness of sins. What a glorious thing that is. Let's stand together. As we drink the cup together, let's be mindful of that new and everlasting covenant that, as we sang, has made us white as snow. Though your sins be as scarlet, he's made them white and pure. Let's drink together. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your willingness to give of your son. And Jesus, your willingness to die for us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that speak to us and gives us the encouragement, Lord God, that all are without excuse. We thank you, Lord, that we stand before you forgiven. Lord, we ask that you would bless the food we're about to eat to the use of our bodies. We pray, Lord God, that you would uh, bless the hands that have prepared it. Strengthen our time of fellowship. Be glorified in it. May our love abound in it as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want us to close just with that chorus. I'll be available up here to pray with or encourage any of you that may need prayer. And just a couple of just practical suggestions in going through the, the line for the food. If you wouldn't mind um, making sure that you're with your kids when they go through, as you know, their eyes tend to be a little bit bigger than their stomach and they end up with four or five pieces of chicken and everything and they're good to go and then they go buy the brownie thing and get the brownie and fill up on the brownie so help them out and if you see some of uh, we've got monitors that are actually watching some of your adults that take more than you should and we're going to make you sit there and eat all your food until <laughs> i'm kidding we're not going to do that but you get the idea just watch your kids if you, if you please could. Sometimes even with the hospitality, we'll send your kids, oh, go get your mom and dad. And uh, it isn't because we're trying to be mean or anything like that. We, we just want to uh, uh, make sure that everybody has, has opportunity to partake. Let's, let's, let's sing together just of, of the strength and the power of our God. God bless you all. Our God is greater. Our God is greater.
stronger.